It is uh, 934, we'll call this meeting to order. Madam Clerk. Approve the minutes of regular meeting of April 18th, 2023. As every member had a chance to review the minutes, and if so, is there any discussion? If there's no discussion on the minutes, I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. All in favor of said, of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do have it. Madam Clerk. Consent agenda <coughs> items one through nine. Chair recognizes Vice Mayor Hoheisel. I would like to pull uh, item five for discussion. Item five will be pulled, and I will be pulling item six. Is there any other items to be pulled? Is there any discussion? If there's no discussion, I'll make a motion to accept staff's recommended action on items one through nine with the exception of five and six on the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. Clerk, where we record uh, the votes. Uh, all in favor of said votes, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Uh, Chair recognizes Vice Mayor Hoheisel for a discussion on item five. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a pretty interesting one. We're working with county to provide um, transportation services to Oaklawn. I have heard on multiple occasions that um, people are interested in um, connectivity to Derby, to Hayesville, some of these uh, surrounding counties as well. Um, I was wondering if we can look at working with county to provide connectivity on bus routes, people getting to and from aircraft industries or um, some of our other businesses. So I didn't know what the rest of council's thoughts were on that. So it sounds like the goal perhaps is to uh, ask for, for the manager to engage with uh, county staff uh, on perhaps a collaborative solution to uh, public transit in that area, is that? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Manager. Mayor, there are two initiatives that are already started regarding transit service. One is, uh, and both of them are through WAMPO. The first one is a service uh, study for our system inside the city of Wichita, and we're anticipating that will be completed, I, I believe, by the end of the year. But WAMPO is also uh, undertaking a regional transit uh, uh, study as well that would address the issues that you're bringing up, and that is service outside the city of Wichita to suburban uh, communities and possible other locations. All right. Well, that sounds like we're on the ball on that one. So, Mr. Manager, just for the uh, sake of, um, uh, of expectations when would that when are we projecting that study to be concluded the first one by the end of the year the second one i'm sorry i don't have information i get that to you excellent thank you is there further discussion on item five could we also maybe reach out to the aircraft company we, we've, we've looked at this in the past a lot of times they want to look at second shift workers mm -hmm. and having so many of them in, in the southwest part of town i've looked at it and they're, they're really in the past hasn't been the second shift crews that we thought but you know, it's always changing all the time. So I think reaching out to them and, and seeing what there is, because because I've, I've, I've fought for this in the past, and I've, to, just to find out that there really weren't the crews out there. But, but, but I think reaching out to them to find out what it looks like today probably help us out a lot. Mayor, if I could. Councilmember, we've had uh, discussions even recently with Spirit regarding uh, service and uh, their willingness to help subsidize. They have not, they, the conversations recently are much like the ones that we've had previously, and that is, I, I don't believe they, they, there's enough of a demand in order to, for them to justify some expense, but that's all part of our service study that will be done. Um, Council Member Johnson's been talking about second shift workers as well for a number of years. Second shift workers is part of our, um, our, our service study inside our boundaries. And, and, and I agree, if, if there's going to be a need, it probably is going to be around those second shift workers because a lot of times they're more entry level because they don't have the seniority to be on first shift. So there probably would be people that maybe be in more needs of transportation. So yeah, I think reaching out to the businesses and I finding think, out the need for I sure. think what we have found is that the current system is not attractive enough for second shift workers to want to ride the hour or whatever it's going to take. So that, that's why the service redesign is so important once we have 
a system that I think is a little more convenient for workers, I think we'll have a better opportunity to provide second shift. Uh, I think we'll have more demand for second shift. And, and just a follow up to the conversation, uh, and to add, I, I think, more support uh, to, to what Councilmember Bluebaugh is mentioning. Uh, we did worked with three different companies early on, uh, it, it, early on when, when I became mayor, uh, to try to figure out a way where they can have a buy-in for a second or third shift option. And when uh, our staff actually asked for basically what would that loop look like to pick up workers and to drop them off at these locations, uh, an overwhelming majority of folks actually matched the zip codes of South Wichita. Uh, which uh, 67217, which is your district, and also Council, uh, Vice Mayor Holheiser's district. Uh, so it, it shows that not only is this uh, an issue uh, uh, for getting folks <coughs> to and from work, uh, where the employers are actually uh, also have skin in the game on this, but all, um, but it's particularly with the, with South Wichita as well, which is you know why I, I think that um, Vice Mayor Holheiser's uh, proposal to figure out how can we kind of cross these. Uh, eliminate some of these barriers are going to be important, but it also adds validity to uh, your work in the past as well. So, wanted to add that. If I could jump in real quick, the biggest challenge right now is employees, and we're <coughs> down 15 drivers for what we currently have. Mm -hmm. So, in order to do second shift, we need another 13 to 14. So, if anybody would like to become a driver for Wichita <laughs> Transit, we oh, need your help. That's true. And with that, we should add that if you don't have your commercial driver's license, we will uh, we can actually help folks obtain a commercial driver's license uh, while they uh, get hired uh, to be a, a driver for the city of Wichita. And this might be its own workshop once we get the study, uh, but there might be some collaborative approaches on utilizing uh, uh, folks who, who might, let's say, drive a school bus during the day. Could we pull those folks in to, to drive? A, um, or during the morning to, to work for the city dur during the day. Like there might be a collaborative approach uh, as we move forward with this, but it sounds like there's a study in place where smart people are looking at it, so let's wait till, till we get the results of that and then we can make some policy changes. So Even any two and a half years here, I might be looking for another job, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is there uh, any more discussion on this? If not, then I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the Sedgwick County Oaklawn Agreement and authorize necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 Uh, the ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Now we are on to item six, the donation of city-owned parcels on 13th Street North, uh, which is in District 1. It's come to our attention that it seems that we need to um, look over the uh, agreement and, and ensure that the will of the council is uh, matching the language within the agreement. Uh, so staff has asked us to pull this uh, and put it on a future agenda. Mr. Manager, what would be your recommendation for a future agenda uh, date? Uh, if not, uh, we could just table it as well. Uh, Mayor, if you would continue this to May 2nd, that would be enough time for us to double check the uh, resolution. Excellent. Uh, so is there any discussion on this or any concerns? If there's not yes, Mayor, I do. Of course. Um, on this item, due to a personal conflict of interest, I'll be abstaining from today's vote. Of course, and we'll make sure that is noted. Um, if there's no further discussion, then I'll make the motion uh, to Poll item six, donation of city-owned parcels on 13th Street North, and to move this item uh, to the May 2nd agenda. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Holheisel. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 <clears throat> All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do have it. Please note that Councilmember Johnson of District 1 has abstained from this vote. Madam Clerk. Board of Bids and Contracts and Wichita Airport Authority Board of Bids and Contracts dated April 24th, 2023. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, Mayor, City Council, Josh Slobber, Department of Finance. The April 24th Board of Bids recommendations are as follows. For engineering, we have the Water Distribution System at Walls Second Edition for NOAC Construction Company Incorporated in the amount of $43,468.25. We have the arterial sidewalk and wheelchair ramp program phase one for Barkley construction in the amount of $130,500. For 
For purchasing, we have the combination high pressure and vacuum debris removal truck for a key equipment and supply company for an aggregate bid total of $457,891.25. We have the sports netting system shield striker sports complex for Varsity Brands Holding Company Incorporated in the amount of $130,240.60. We have the grounds maintenance services for production and pumping for Choice Industries Incorporated for $102,625. This will be a redirection. We have the paper products, toilet tissue, towels, and miscellaneous paper products for Brady Industries of Kansas, Group 6, for $12,488. This will also be a redirection. We have the 175 gallon turf sprayer for professional turf products in the amount of $53,074.75. The Limit Torque L120 4015 electric actuators for Mead O'Brien in the amount of $54,412. For airport, we have the Airport Jabara Snow Removal Equipment Building Construction deferred to May 2nd. And we have the repair and maintenance of 2051 Airport Road for Conco Incorporated in the amount of $220,200. This is how to become a vendor with the City of Wichita. These are open requests for proposals out on the street. And I'd recommend to approve the bid boards as recommended and happy to answer any questions. Questions for staff. Chair recognizes Councilmember Tuttle. Thank you. Can you go back to slide five, please? Sure. Thank you. First, I just want to thank staff. I know that this is a time sensitive issue because we're trying to make sure that we meet the netting improvements before the tournament this summer that's going to bring many visitors to our community and just a great thing. I was just interested that Varsity Brand Holdings and BSN Sports had the exact same bid down to the penny. I don't think I've ever seen that. Yeah, so that was one that we had to research as well because it piqued my interest. So the reason this is non-responsible is that this was a corporate versus satellite location issue. It was good for the city that we had more bids, but the actual um, responsible bidder, Varsity Brands Holding Company Incorporated, is the corporate office. They are the only ones authorized to actually bid on the product. The sales rep did the same thing. They had the matching uh, taxpayer identification number or tax ID. So basically it was the same company bidding twice. Yep. Okay, very interesting. Oh, that's a, a, that's a, a first. Do you do a coin toss? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> no <laughs> first we, against each other. Yeah, I was gonna say if the, uh, the, the salesperson had commission coming, I, they won, right? No, thank you for explaining that, very interesting. Good question. Further discussion. If there's no further discussion, I'll make the motion to accept staff's recommended action on this item. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and then seconded. Uh, all in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, them same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Madam Clerk. Petitions for public improvements. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor, City Council members. I have a couple petitions for your consideration this morning. Paul Gunselman, Public Works Engineering. The signatures on all petitions represent 100% of the improvement district. The, valid, the petitions are valid per Kansas statute. The first petition for your consideration is West Link Christian Church Edition in District 5. The project will provide sewer improvements required for a lot split and existing commercial development. And the second item for your consideration this morning is Cadillac Lake Second Edition, also in District 5. On September 6, 2022, the City Council approved water and sewer improvements to serve Cadillac Lake Second Edition. The, de the developer has submitted revised petitions to correct the legal description in the improvement district. The project budget remains the same. Recommended action is to approve the new and revised petitions and the new budget, adopt the new, new and amending resolutions and authorize the necessary signatures. I'll stand for any questions. Questions for staff. See none if there's no questions or discussion. 
Then I will make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to approve the new and revised petition and new budget, adopt the new and amending resolutions, and authorize the necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Madam Clerk. Council member appointments and comments. Let's start off with appointments, if that's okay. Council Member Johnson. Thanks, Mayor. I'd like to reappoint Malia Mitchell to the District 1 Advisory Board Youth Member position and reappoint Dr. K. Monk Morgan to the Wichita Land Bank. Further appointments? Uh, Council Member Fry. Thank you, sir. I'd like to appoint Stacy Wontorski to DAB 5. Further appointments? I have a list, board appointments. Uh, to acknowledge the Stormwater Advisory Board appointment to the Sustainability Board, which is Scott uh, Lindbach. To acknowledge the MAPC appointment to the Sustainability Board, which is Deborah, Deborah Voster. To acknowledge the following appointments to the Transit Board. WSU reappoints Ellen Abbey. Wichita Downtown Development Corporation reappoints Jason Gregory. And Access Advisory Board appoints Craig Per back. I'll make a motion to accept the appointments. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Vice Mayor Hoheisel. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, the same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. Into discussion. Is there a discussion for the good of the group? <coughs> I actually have a discussion item that I believe we might have to vote on, and I apologize, it's an off-agenda item. I was summoned yesterday to Topeka today for a ceremonial bill signing on um, one of uh, our legislative agenda items, uh, which is the uh, bill that will help us with uh, reduce um, Cadillac converter thefts. Uh, that is being signed today at 2 o'clock, uh, which means I might have to sneak out if our budget meeting goes uh, later than anticipated. Uh, however, I do... Uh, uh, would like to, since we have the opportunity with today's meeting, uh, would like that travel approved by the council. Uh, so with that, I make a motion to approve travel to Topeka today uh, and to return today uh, for the mayor uh, for this uh, ceremonial bill signing. Is there a second? Second. Thanks. Uh, seconded by Vice Mayor Holheisel. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do have it. I thank you all. And we'll be accepting audio book recommendations between now and when we leave. Is there, yes, Council Member Tuttle. Thank you. Um, on Saturday, I had the opportunity to go to just a wonderful event. Last Tuesday, we celebrated a proclamation for Week of the Young Child, which helps to recognize early learning providers in our community. So on Saturday was their Impact Awards and um, had about 200 child care providers, early learning providers in, in attendance. And it was just truly a day of celebration for all the work that they do and for that profession, which is so needed in our workforce and our economic development community. But also wanted to point out that Adrian Ladd, who is our very own director of child care licensing here at the city of Wichita, was nominated for an award and um, for a community partner award. And, and I got to see firsthand how many people just truly love and respect the work that she and her team do. So just a shout out to, to Adrian and our child care licensing staff. Thank you. Wonderful. Further discussion or announcements for the good of the group? Vice Mayor, what's going on this weekend? Uh, we do have Brush Up Broadway, um, 8 o'clock in the morning along the South Broadway corridor. Um, we also have uh, Tree Fest, I believe, uh, Council Member Ballard. Yep. That and then six. there's also a Fighting Fentanyl event at Town West Square. I believe Yeep is putting that on. Um, so it's going to be a busy day Saturday. I uh, hope, hope the weather kind of holds out. We need the rain, but let's push the rain off until Saturday evening, right? Is that a motion? <laughs> All right, for the discussion. See none with that, I'll make a motion to adjourn this meeting and to go into our uh, scheduled workshop. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do indeed have it. The chair recognizes the honorable uh, manager, Layton. Th thank you, Mayor. 
Um, we have two items for you today. Um, the second item, of course, is the budget workshop, and then we'll be significant discussion about our current status and uh, seeking some direction from you. But the first item is our, uh, the first annual report on ASM Global's operation of Century 2, which includes the Bob Brown Convention Facility. Um, Lindsay Banaka is going to make the uh, comments. We also have representatives from ASM here today uh, to discuss uh, their, uh, their activities during the past year. With that, turn over to Lindsay. Welcome, Lindsay. Good morning, Lindsay Banaka, Director of Arts and Cultural Services uh, with the City Manager's Office. Um, I'm just going to present uh, Chris Whitney, who's the General Manager at Century 2 right now, uh, who oversees uh, the operations with ASM. I do want to point out that you should have received uh, this snazzy uh, booklet uh, with the annual operating um, uh, report from 2022, but we'll be going over it in detail in this presentation. So without further ado, Chris Whitney. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I just returned from Vegas, and, or from Vegas, from vacation, <laughs> where I was in Phoenix, and I'm like 85 and sunny and no humidity or allergies, and welcome back to the rainy day. So I like that motion to uh, make for no rain on Saturday. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share with you a little bit of background on our first year. Um, so as Lindsay said, I'm Chris Whitney. Also with me today is John Hale, our Assistant General Manager, AKA the Legacy of Century Two, and we're so grateful for him. And then also in the audience is AJ Bileski, General Manager of Interest Bank Arena, representing ASM Global. <clears throat> A little bit of background, how we got here and how I'm standing in front of you today. Uh, we started the contract um, October 1st of 2021 for a 90-day um, consulting period and then actually took over management of Century 2 January 1st of 2022. <clears throat> we had, during that, during that period of time, we had city staff still on, on the premises assisting with the transition and they left uh, first weekend in February and then Public Works was with us through the end of April. Uh, helping our engineers get up to speed on on really managing the the, the beast of the of the guts of that of the building. So we truly appreciate that assistance through that transition period. Um, and then the other the other thing to recognize is 2022 is really the first year coming out of the pandemic. So as we compare financials, we compare information, we look at 2019 as the benchmark versus just looking at the previous year because we're finally, I feel like, back to a good, solid event calendar load. We're seeing that in the industry. We believe that the convention center business fully will come back around in 23, but in 2022 is a, is a good benchmark to look at. <clears throat> So looking at where we ended the year, again, on a calendar year basis for 2022, this, the city subsidized uh, the operations of $1.2 million. And that, comparing to previous years, that's a, that's a decline in the subsidy. And that was one of the goals that was laid out to ASM in the beginning, was that we needed to reduce the city subsidy with the overall operations. As we included in 2022 was some of those transitional type expenses of, of one-time costs of coming off of city IT, getting onto our own networks, getting buying computers, getting all the kind of startup business, getting a copier. That was one of the things I remember from day one. Um, but uh, so as we look to 2023, we've gotten our presence with our national agents and promoters. We are continuing to look to see that subsidy continue to decrease. So what did we learn? Um, you know, this Dante challenged us with um, sharing lessons learned. And as a longtime resident of Wichita, I did not have an appreciation for how busy Century 2 actually is. We, among the staff, say every day is an event day. Um, we had 40, 545 rental days and 282 event days in, in 2022. Difference between a rental day and event day is Move in rental days include move in, move out, dark days um, reserved by the by the client. Whereas the event day is when they're actually open to the public for their event or for um, <clears throat> their trade show or whatnot. May I, ask a, may I ask a question? So, if an event day, let's say that it's the women's fair that's coming up this yeah. weekend, and it's three days, is that or is it a unique encounter? <clears throat> so it's three event days. Okay. It's five rental days okay. because they, they start moving today. So it's not by organization, it's the actual number of the days? 
Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more qualifying question. When you say Century 2, you're talking about convention center, uh, performing arts, the entire complex as a whole when you're saying Century 2, correct? That's correct. Okay. The entire property. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I will say that throughout, throughout the presentation. <clears throat> um, we've learned that existing users of the building, especially those that have been users of the building for a long period of time, believe that their dates are their dates forever. So take, um, there's a particular event the first weekend in October, and they believe that's their date from now on till the end of time. And that's been um, a learning experience to work through that. Um, some clients before we got here were, have been allowed to hold dates 10 years out. And that's proven to be a challenge as well of trying to, hey, that's longer than our management term, and trying to work through, um, that's, that's a long time. You're going to have to go to contract every time one of those events gets challenged. We've learned that certain event mixes, another, well, let me back up. Another goal we were told, not only to reduce the subsidy, increase revenues, manage costs. So <clears throat> we looked at how can we maximize revenues, create a guest experience while reducing cost. And so the weekend of December 4th, 5th, we had John Denver tribute, and Christmas with C.S. Lewis over in Mary Jane Teal. We had music theater, holiday special over in Concert Hall. Obviously, the concession stand in Concert Hall has been remodeled. It's much bigger. It has a larger lobby space than Mary Jane Teal. We opened the doors in between the two, obviously working with music theater on this, and allowed patrons from, music th from Mary Jane Teal to flow over in a concert hall, giving a great guest experience of expanded concessions, as well as minimizing costs with labor. Their intermissions were at different times, so the guests never saw the other guests, but we were able to keep staff busy the entire duration of a show versus the right before the show, then at intermission, and they have these long dead periods. So working to creatively find ways to drive up revenues, decreasing expenses. Another lesson we learned, um, as I'm sure most companies in downtown Wichita have experienced, is the security concerns around the building. Um, there's vandalism, broken windows, as you've experienced with the, with the former library, um, loitering around the building, and just general access to the building. Um, when I first got there, the building was, was wide open. And as, just as an employee, I was concerned. Um, so one of the things we did was we went through and identified all of the badges that have access to the basement and shut off over 100 parking or badge accesses to people that had really no reason to have access, but they just, they did, creating trying to lock down that basement area so that we don't just have random people coming in and creating a security concern. The other thing we did was we locked down the building so that on non-event days, you can't just wander in and do your laundry in the bathroom as we found. Uh, so by moving the box office to the exterior concert hall box office, we still have ability for guests to come in throughout the day, but now they're checking in with somebody that serves as a ticket seller as well as a receptionist. And then we put a badge access on the door so you can badge yourself in if you're an employee or a tenant, or the box office can call and let you know you have a guest here. <clears throat> We recognize Mary Jane Teal Theater um, is what a unique space. Um, I love this, probably my favorite space in the whole building. It's very intimate, it's got great color, um, and it's completely underutilized. Um, in 2022, we do appreciate the city having the, the state of the city address in that theater. Um, thank you, Mayor, for that. And we had 20 events in that theater, um, to 92. 98 rental days, so about 26% utilization. That space has approximately 600 plus seats, and as we have run into um, several date availability issues with Concert Hall, we've been able to slide shows over into Mary Jane Teal. So it's, again, another great space um, that's underutilized, so we're looking to, to put more content in that, in that space. We've identified opportunities to grow and create new streams of revenue, including adding valet parking for our ticketed uh, theater events. We are looking at ways to expedite food and beverage sales. The last thing anybody wants to do is stand in line 
for, for a cocktail or for popcorn or, or whatnot. So when the new Wi-Fi system gets in place, we will then be able to do mobile ordering, especially on the trade show floors where vendors can order from their booth, go pick up the food when it's ready and not have to stand in line. Um, Right now, what we're doing is allowing for guests to pre-order their intermission drinks. So when they're ordering their first drink at the beginning of the show, they can order for their drink just to pick up at intermission on the theater side. And then we're also creating alternative uses of existing spaces. One of the newest things that we've rolled out is what we call the balcony lounge. This is in concert hall on the second level. This was just dead space that was not used. We've added additional points of sale for food and beverage up there, created a seating area, and opened the doors so that guests can come up the stairs before the house opens. It's been interesting to watch guests stand at the open door of the stairs, like there's a fence on it that they can't come through, and it's trying to educate, come on in, it's, it's, the second floor is open, and help alleviate that pinch point at the food and beverage um, points of sale in the, in the main lobby. As a finance girl, I think one of the things that shocked me the most was utilities, of how much utilities are running well over budget. We saw $350,000 overspend on utilities, and that's one of the things that I challenged engineering with right out of the gate. The um, age of the HVAC system, the lack of automation on those systems, has created significant challenges in driving this energy. Um, Trying to, trying to heat Expo Hall in July um, heat, July and August heat has been, has been a, new, a new record for our engineering team of how many hours it's it, to, to try to finagle that. So we do have in our CIP plan that we'll get into here in a minute um, some upgrades to that system, so hopefully we see those costs start to come down. We also learned that the C2 energy plant that's on the west side of the building also provides service to the shuttered library. So when there was, Issues that occurred over the, over the Christmas day when there was a, some kind of a water break, or I, I can't remember what happened, over in the library, it caused our utility usage to go up at C2 because it's providing service. So it's something that we certainly will need to work together with figuring that out if, if and when something happens with, the, with that library of how to, how to manage and track utility usage on, on that side. <clears throat> So what are we doing? We're to uh, position Century around it. Um, and, you know, ASM was hired to come in and do the best job that we can with the current building and looking toward the future to be part of, of whatever should come down, down, the, down the road. But what we wanted to do was tell the story. Tell the story that Century 2 is open for business and we are here to take care of your events and your guests. We developed a bi-weekly newsletter highlighting upcoming events. That, again, one of the things that I never knew, being a resident of Wichita, was how busy this building was. And I was, we talked about how can we tell our people what's coming, even if it's not a ticketed event. Did anybody know that KMEA brings thousands of people to downtown area and the restaurants are packed? And how are we going to communicate that? And let's welcome these events. So we have a bi-weekly newsletter that goes out just highlighting the next two or three events coming up. I, I'm just curious, who is the newsletter going to? Like how, and is it electronic? Is it, what is it? But how, you said our people, who are your, the people? So the newsletter is digital. It goes out email. There's a subscriber list of about 82,000 people. Wow. And that is people that have bought tickets before, people that have signed up on our website. Um, it's, it's a database that was currently not being used. Um, but if they've purchased a ticket through Century 2 or through Select a Seat, they're on this list. And, of course, they have the option to opt out, but they are receiving it. Mm -hmm. Good on you. Mm -hmm. We transitioned to Savor Food and Beverage Concessions in 2022. Savor is an in-house food and beverage division of ASM Global. We carry very high standards. As you know, they are also the uh, food and beverage provider at Entrust Bank Arena. So we transitioned February 1st to bringing that in-house. We rebranded the logo, as you can see here, with new colors, a new kind of a fresh look, but still giving, giving um, a nod to the, to the iconic roof. We created a new website. 
uh, and launch that, making it very user friendly, able to, we manage that in house so we can make changes quickly as, as requests come up or needs, needs arise. On the back end side, we converted to a new booking software. The city had been on a program called Event Pro that was cumbersome and difficult to use. You couldn't get real life, real time data out of that system quickly. So we switched over to a booking software called VenueOps, which allows us to provide, to pull utilization rates at the drop of a, anytime somebody has a question, to provide real time instant availability to promoters and agents. One thing with that with that group, they don't wait, and they want when they ask for a question, they want it right now. So that allows for that. And then we also converted to select a seat ticketing, um, and we'll get into that a little bit further down the road in the presentation. We worked collaboratively with Public Works uh, to provide a 10-year CIP plan to the city of Wichita l last year that you, the council, have approved um, in excess of 18 million dollars. We are greatly appreciative of that. I know that um, took some time to work through, but um, a, a good plan, a good start. We have a proactive approach to that asset management and preventative maintenance. We're in the, we're in the early infant stages of, of integrating our ASM platform um, that can provide preventative maintenance reports to the, to the uh, manager's office upon request of what, do you, what are the assets, how are you taking care of them, what are the needs. Um, that will also help to continue the CIP process. We've worked with Public Works also collaboratively developing a policy and procedures for emergency repairs, understanding that you know, we're unique in that we're a private management company, but inevitably emergency repairs will come up. Um, and so trying to figure out what is that process and how are we gonna, how are we gonna work through that? Because in a situation of emergency, you need to be able to make a decision quickly to continue the, the flow of business. As you see here, this is Connecting Lobby. We worked collaboratively with Visit Wichita and appreciate their partnership. Um, they funded the, the signage, the new signage that's in this area in advance of the small meeting market uh, planning, small market meeting planners conference that was held in October. Yes? Um, this might be a question more for the manager. Um, what is the timeline for when the roof repairs are going to start? Design is completed. Uh, I think we reported this out a few weeks ago. At that time, uh, we were, uh, it was under state review because of the tax credits. And once we get approval, I believe we're ready to go out to bid. It's my recollection. <clears throat> okay, and we're making sure, is that going to interfere with any of the programming that's going to be going on in Century 2? Not that I'm aware of in terms of the roof work. Um, now, there is other work that's scheduled this year, I think HVAC and uh, some others, and we'll have to work with ASM on how that impacts the users. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page there and it wasn't interrupting any programming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so speaking of capital projects, <laughs> that was a perfect segue. Um, here you see the list of the projects um, the Public Works is taking the lead on. Of, of course, the roof is is the big the big dollar item there. Um, it was interesting as soon as that hit the newspaper. How many calls I received of opinions of what color we should paint the roof, and it was a mix between we should paint it blue and we should paint it the city flag. And I thought, interesting. Okay, I think we're going with blue. <laughs> so, um, and Public Works is here to be able to speak on, on behalf of their projects and, and what they're taking the lead on. <clears throat> There's an additional 2.9 million in CIP projects that ASM will be taking the lead on, specifically 1.5 million related to the HVAC upgrades over Expo Hall. Um, I, have a, I have an intimate um, knowledge of um, unit 12A because <laughs> our engineers let me know how much they love 12A. Um, and then the other big project that's, that is in the works is a $700,000 uh, Wi-Fi system um, that is desperately needed to, to manage uh, today's operations. Uh, Chris, the, yes? the Wi-Fi uh, upgrade you know, or installation is being paid for by ASM, isn't that correct? No, it's not. It, yeah, it was no. in the in the overall eighteen okay. million. I, all right, I mm -hmm. couldn't remember what your cap. <laughs> okay. 
So other things we're doing to position Century 2, again, I, I mentioned just telling our story. We're, we're attending industry conferences for professional development. It's important that our employees, um, not a lot of employees have event-related experience and they need that training. And so sending them to network with other professionals within the industry is critical. A ASM Global also has national booking meetings, marketing meetings, GM meetings, and getting us together to collaborate, share ideas, what's working, what's not, what's the future trends. So much of the fresh new ideas that come, come from this collaboration together. Um, working with national agents and promoters, again, another goal that we heard was book more national touring acts. Let's fill up Concert Hall, let's fill up Mary Jane Teal. How can we get more national touring shows in here? So we're working with, our booking team is working to bring those national touring shows. In 2022, we saw um, five specific shows, Jurassic Quest, uh, an immersive dinosaur experience over an expo hall. That's coming back again in 23. We had Four Things Live with Amy Brown. She has um, launched her own podcast and wanted to, um, flirt with the idea of taking that on a national tour roadshow, and so she kicked off that tour here in Wichita with her ties to Wichita. So we had that. <clears throat> we talked about the John Denver experience in the C.S. Lewis, and then we also had a, a prolific comedy show um, in Concert Hall. <clears throat> We've identified also that there can, can in some spaces, you can't have um, corresponding events because of the sound bleed between the stages. But what we have, what we do know, is that we can have a concert in Expo Hall and a concert in Concert Hall happening simultaneously without a sound lead. So working with partners to try to create new content where we can build a stage and put something in Expo Hall that will drive revenue in that space while we're still having something in the round building. <clears throat> so how does ASM, what, what value do we bring? Um, you know, I know that there was a lot, of, a lot of opinion on whether or not to privatize Century 2. And so the value that we bring, um, active, engaging social media platforms, it is important to tell a story and tell it often because there is so much um, competition for the dollar, for the discretionary dollar. And how do we want them? We want them to spend it in, in the Wichita area, and we want them to spend it in our building. And so we have to, again, tell people the story, but also create it engaging. It can't just be a boring news post of, oh, women's fairs this weekend. We have to do something fun. How are we going to en en engage those people? And one of the things that we've done at the live theater events is you'll see our patrons and our guests on our social media page and we'll tell them, hey, tag yourself and show them having a great time and show them, you know, we do a recap of the event afterwards. So creating that engagement. Um, we talked about the bi-weekly newsletter. We've also implemented email blasts, which is different than the newsletter in that it's a targeted email for a particular event with a link to click through to purchase tickets. Um, and so just from, again, this is just reflective through 2022, um, that new concept created $70,000 in additional ticket revenue that may or may not have existed if people knew the events were coming. We've rebranded the venue, again, with the new logo, with the colors, um, <clears throat> and you'll continue to see that more and more as you come through the building. Transitioning to select a seat ticketing, the previous ticketing platform that, you, that the city was on, Audience View, was very expensive, and it was also not user-friendly. It, it was a, a lot of clicks and a lot of process for a ticket seller to sell a ticket. At a flat show like a women's fair, like a gun show, guests don't want to stand in line waiting for their, for their ticket. They'd, they'd be perfectly happy with a rolled ticket. So that process has to be sped up. Um, also, we wanted to create an opportunity, A, select a seat as a brand name known here in town. And now guests can purchase tickets at the box office at Interest Bank Arena or at Century 2. So it's cr creating multiple avenues for people to be able to buy tickets um, without, the, without the convenience fees of being online. <clears throat> Another thing to point out is we hired full-time staff. Um, and that would, seems like, well, yeah, okay, of course you did. Well, we only had two employees that opted to come over from the city. Um, and so we were starting at ground zero. And so to build a full-time staff and build a part-time pool of employees that most likely didn't have event experience and trying to train them up with 
while we're still this very busy building um, is a huge testament to our team. We have a phenomenal team. I'm so proud of them. Um, but the, in, the, in the staffing shortages, COVID really took a toll on our industry. Um, <clears throat> when, you sh when you shutter like we did, we lost so many stagehands that, that they had to go back and find you know, what we call real jobs. They had to go find work. Um, a lot of the people with the event experience said, <clears throat> so this is what it's like to work Monday through Friday or not to work at all. And so there's just been a lot of talent in the industry lost um, as a result of that. So another goal we were given was to create a good working relationship with the Save Century 2 organization. <clears throat> and so through that collaboration with them, um, I would say we do have a great working relationship with them. They took care of the flower beds outside and around Century 2 on a volunteer basis. And they made it look fantastic, cleaned up the trash, made the flower beds look great. If we would have had to pay for that labor, that would have been a significant expense. And we are grateful for their efforts. They also partnered with the Wichita Wurlitzer to uh, promote their 50th anniversary event that was in December. That was a sold out event. And that was, that was a neat event to see this organ come out of the, come out of the, of the closet and, and the sound that it makes was just absolutely beautiful. So good, re good relationship there. <clears throat> so the changes, we've talked about some of them. Um, the others to add in, we started, adding event security to every event. Um, this was important just not only to keep the outside food and beverage from coming in, but more so that there's a, somebody looking at the door, somebody paying attention to something that doesn't look right, that whole see something, say something, to have dedicated eyes. And helping, the other thing that they do is they help sweep the property after getting close to the end of an event. So when guests are leaving to go to their cars, there's not significant amount of loiterers around the property providing a safer experience. We added a facility fee um, late in the year after working with the, with the manager's office on this. Um, basically, we know that, again, to reduce the subsidy, there has to be money still being reinvested back into the property for maintenance and repairs and things every day. Something is, <laughs> uh, is a challenge of, of of, of an older building. And so being able to add a dollar facility fee on the flat shows, a $4 facility fee on the national touring shows has created a way to have a very minimal cost passed on to the patron who's using the building and causing the wear and tear without a significant rent increase to the event organizers. Chris, are those projects identified by your staff or working with Public Works to decide what gets this fee applied to it? It's developed by our staff, by our engineering team. And this is, this is not capital projects. This is just the everyday wear and tear. Routine maintenance. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. We talked about Saver taking over concessions. We started that February 1st. We generated $575,000 in gross revenue as compared to $499,000 the, from the previous concessionaire in 2019 for a full calendar year. So again, providing a being open <laughs> during the events to providing a good quality product and providing, you know, there's a signature drink at every, every concert hall performance, creating an experience. How can you get the lines moving faster? So um, a, a, a nice increase in gross revenue there. This 499 represents uh, what the previous concessionaire had had. We developed preferred partnerships with third-party vendors such as Helgerson's Decorating Company, um, Kent AV, and our T-shirt uh, security event security company. Um, and so as, the, as they are a preferred provider, they're the name that we provide to the event organizer. And so then there is a percentage that comes back in as revenue from those preferred vendors. And then an um, improved partnership with Visit Wichita and, and Hyatt Hotels working collaboratively to, to chase new business as well as chase the business that perhaps was in the building previously that has left and to get that back. <clears throat> so our difference and what we focus on is certainly the guest experience, improving the client experience. We know that there's a lot of options for people to host their events, for people to go spend their money to attend events. and. <clears throat> We know that that guest experience, they have to have a good experience or they're not going to come back. There's just too much competition. We send a personalized thank you to each client following their event. 
and asking them for their feedback and asking, if we have fallen short of your expectations, please share that feedback with us. That's how we get better. We're in the process of getting ready to roll out a customer survey program as well. Again, to, to garner that feedback of how, we can only get better, we can only make your events better if we know what your, what your feedback is. <clears throat> we hope that as we transition, there, continue the transition, that there will be more of that feedback and concerns coming directly to us versus you guys having to, to channel that information coming your way and then and, and sending it our way. Um, we want to create a, a collaborative work with our, with our event organizers. Providing the marketing support to our clients unlike ever before. Um, the things that we do on the back end for our clients to, to, on social medias and on the digital boards, um, on the websites, <clears throat> the, it's interesting how many event organizers say, well, how much will that cost us? And we're like, that there's, there's not a cost, that's just a service that we provide. And so they, to see them get excited behind the support we're providing them. <clears throat> we, um, also, we entered into a stage, IATSE stagehand agreement. Um, this, there was an agreement in place with the city, but they were on a separate payroll company, so they weren't actually city employees. So through our negotiations with that, they became ASM employees. They're paid through our payroll. We can provide them the training that they need. Um, funding a training program that is desperately needs to be utilized and get that skill level back up. <clears throat> we follow a cost accounting method um, by for each event, tracking each revenue and expense that's related to each show by show, so that when when the manager's office comes over to review the financial statements, they can see exactly how profitable was a women's fair versus the gun show versus the swap meet. You can see down to that level as to what events are profitable and what events aren't. Chris, can I ask a question about that? And so what do you do with that then? So what if you find out that, I don't know, the Tuttle Performing Arts Show wasn't profitable? Do you work with that entity to try and give them <coughs> feedback and suggestions? Would you ever say you weren't profitable, we can't partner with you again? And how do you use that? That sounds like a great <coughs> data and robust data. I'm just curious how we're going to use that. Thank you. Yeah, it, and that's a great question. Um, it certainly helps, um, I think, provide the backbone of w when you have date conflicts and somebody who has been a user of the building for years and you have another entity who's coming in that is going to bring substantially more revenue, it, it allows to have the informed conversation about what are we going to do. It's not always about the bottom line and it's not always about we make more money on this event versus that event. It's about the quality of life for our, for our residents, but it's it's helps provide solid information to better to make better decisions. Thank you. <clears throat> so here is a slide that shows you just the makeup. Um, we had so back to your question of rental days versus event days. So we had 130 unique events in 2022 with an attendance total of estimated of 250,000, over 250,000. Now that's not just ticketed events, that's estimates based on how many people attended the chamber luncheon and how many people came to this, that, or the other type of trade show or, or um, convention where there's not necessarily tickets sold to the event. Really the building is split 50-50 down the middle. 50% of conventions and trade shows using expo hall, exhibition hall, convention hall, and 50% of the building using the two theaters, concert hall and Mary Jane Teal. Um, so it's, it's really almost having to use both sides of, of thinking about the business as two separate businesses, even though they're all under basically one roof because of how much, how different they are. I mean, when you have a conversation about a trade show, you're dealing with 250 vendors loading in for Women's Fair today. You're talking about Hamilton, and they need a pit net. And I just got to learn what a pit net was this morning. And it's like, OK, that, that's very different conversations all in one breath. So um, you can see on the left, then, is the percentage of, of event mix. Other is made up of concerts, of festivals, of um, like we have the Asian Fest, we have the Diwali Festival, um, various city events um, through that we've hosted. And then on the right, you can see the percentage of event income. <clears throat> so um, 
again, back to being able to detail out uh, how much each event makes. Can, can you tell me how much demand do we have for a ballroom? How many people in choir want them to utilize a ballroom? You know, that's a great question. Um, the, I would say there's not a lot of demand currently because there's not one that exists as far as the, the book of business that's currently in place is the book of business that has been in this building historically for many, many years. It's that chasing the new business and the, and the larger conventions, that's where the, the demand for a new ballroom really rises to the level of the need that we have. Okay. One, one of the plans that we had on, on the Century 2 had a um, $30 million ballroom, and I was just trying to identify if you had a lot of people contacting us wanting to know if we had a facility like that. And you, you're telling me you really don't hear a lot, about a lot of demand right now, but... The, the, to me, the largest book of business that's missing from the whole Century 2 business model is the banquets and the galas. And there's not a place to have, I mean, you could do it in exhibition hall, but it, it just kind of has a weird setup and it's a long way from the kitchen and the push from, from the kitchen, the quality, anyways, it, that's the book of business that is se severely missing. And when you compare us to the Tulsa Convention Center, that is their primary book of business. And so the use of their ballroom, like for us to host a wedding, there's not really a great space. You either have this massive exhibition hall or this small concert hall lobby area. So to host a wedding is, is very, very difficult. And that's really where those ballrooms come in or, or those galas, the fundraisers. And what, what facility in Tulsa are they doing that in? At the Tulsa, it's called the Cox Business Convention Center. Okay, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the market challenges. So, Obviously, we've, we've identified some. You're certainly aware of it. The uncertainty surrounding the fate of the venue. I remember when I took the job back in January, the number one question I got is, I thought they were tearing that down. Or you need to make sure that they don't tear that down. It, it just, it's, I'm sure you hear it as well. It's just the, un, the what, what's happening with it made it very challenging to convince staff to take a job with us. Um, I've had a director of finance position open since October and have had very minimal amount of applicants and that's the number one question. And so I'd like to make sure that we're here to say we are open for business and we are, we are solid organization and solid to come work for. Um, but that's created some challenges. Certainly some staffing shortages within the industry. Um, and then the community's perception that Century 2 is, is underutilized. In fact, I just had a dear Evan Hansen. I had a, um, a conversation with actually somebody who's employed with the city who says, oh yeah, Century 2 sits dark all day, all the time. And I thought, huh, you want a job here? Um, so there's this perception that it's underutilized. So we've got to do better there. And then costs are higher than anticipated. Certainly with utilities, when Evergy raised their rates back in July, you know, when there's 25% rate increase, that comes down. When you, when you buy eggs, the costs are high. Yes, sir. Um, thank you. Um, you said earlier, and I just want to just ask again, you said we had two employees from the city of Wichita who came over. Mm -hmm. um, was there interest from any of the other employees, or they, they just preferred to stay within the city of Wichita? So I don't actually have that information because I wasn't here at that point. I can certainly have AJ come forward and answer that question. Okay, yeah, I just I was just curious about that one. Okay. AJ. Hello, AJ Bolesky with Interest Bank Arena and ASM Global. So when we started that conversation and we did the transition, we met with every single employee, full-time employee that had, was employed by the city working at Century 2, made an offer for all of them that were interested in coming over to ASM Global. I think the biggest challenge with it was the retirement benefits that are in place with the city that already existed. Uh, that's pretty much what it came down to in most cases. And so then in the end, we had two that, that came over to our company. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Get your steps in back and forth, right? <laughs> Facility challenges, you've heard this 
over and over and over again, certainly as, as you just recently heard the new uh, proposal, uh, it, these are real and, and these, are, these are definite um, things to consider when, when we're booking the building. It, there is facility challenges of you have all of this space and the fact that you can't have a concert and exhibition hall and a concert and concert hall happening at the same time because of the sound bleed is probably my, one of my biggest frustrations is we have all this square footage to book and yet we can't because of, of some of the challenges. And then just the outdated spaces. Um, the, the, the dressing rooms, you know, in today's society to have communal showers is just inappropriate and uh, needs to be addressed. And it is in the CIP plan, but it, it's just very outdated spaces. I mean, concert hall looks great. It went through the remodel more recently than the rest of the building. But um, as you consider down the future, there's, there's um, certainly improvements that need to be made that cause it, cause it challenging to book the space and provide that economic impact that we're looking for. <clears throat> Policy challenges, some of the, some of the things, um, again, that we were challenged with was booking more national touring shows. And, and one of the biggest challenges that we've run into based on policy, current policy, is that the availability of concert hall is very limited. <clears throat> it's a great space, it's a 2,000 seat theater. Um, but the tenants, the two tenants, Music Theater of Wichita and Wichita Symphony, um, account for 40, about 45% of the rental days. And even though like a music theater may have a show with eight days of performances, they block out three weeks prior to that to build the sets and for the rehearsals and, and whatnot. The same with the symphony. When they have a, when they have a performance on a Sunday, they've, they've booked the entire week leading into that for their rehearsals. So the fact that we don't have dedicated rehearsal space for them somewhere else, they say, you know, when, I, when we try to move them to a different location, it's like, well, if we can't practice in the space with the, with the orchestra trail, it makes no sense to rehearse. And so that has created um, some challenges. We had, when we talk about the $417,000 in lost revenue, this was working with national promoters and agents that were looking to hold dates put a national touring show here and we didn't have the date availability. <clears throat> so the tenants are currently under an MOU uh, with the city that goes through December of 2026. They receive significant rental discounts and they're on rates that were initially established back in 2012. So it's, it's, uh, there's a little bit of disparity. They've been allowed to operate their own ticketing platforms so there's no revenue share in their ticketing uh, service fees as well. So just something to note and the challenges that it provides when we're trying to, to book these national shows. Chris, doesn't that also create a facility challenge for you, <clears throat> especially with some of the national touring shows because of the way you have to load in and load out? You're actually taking days away from, I mean right now you're listing 45% of rental days for concert hall, but don't you have to s separate days for convention hall to be able to go through and load in and load out because of the way the building is built, constructed? That's correct. Through Exhibition Hall, they, right. it's, they have to load through that. So if there's a, like we can't load in when a show is active. If a show is in the middle of their move in, we have to work collaboratively with them to say, hey, we're also going to have Dear Evan Hansen pushing through your space. So how many days is that taking out of your revenue projections? Yeah. Any it, idea? It, Mm, I don't have that off the top of my head. I've, It'd be interesting to know if you mm -hmm. could calculate that, just because that's lost revenue as well. Yeah, so. for sure. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Rental rates across the building are certainly below market value. Um, you know, an, an average industry is about 10 to 15 cents per square foot. So if you did that math on just on exhibition hall, um, that would rent, have a daily rental of $4,400 per day. The current rental on that room is $1,300 a day. So the fact that it's below industry standard, and that's not industry standard of a brand new convention center like Oklahoma City. That's, that's on incomparable markets. The other thing that existed was discounts. There was discounts given for government entities, for nonprofits. And so and if, uh, we talked about the tenants. So it seemed like everybody that was having a show at, at Century 2 was receiving some sort of a discount. So again, working with the manager's office to try to remove those without having to raise rental rates, but let's try to remove some of the, some of the, just the automatics that are driving 
pulling down revenue um, that doesn't create a significant impact to the particular event organizer, but collectively it can start to, can start to add up. <clears throat> Certainly there was a lack of consistency from client to client. There were many unwritten uh, discounts and allowances given, such as if they were having an event day, they were given a move-in rate, which is substantially different in price. Um, a lot of equipment was used without being charged for. Certainly the discounts um, provided that were inconsistent as to how was it applied. Um, so trying to create consistency and that transparency to each client. <clears throat> and then the current booking policy that's in place provides its own challenges. Um, back to some of the people that have been allowed to book out for 10 years, doesn't have a huge significant Im economic impact to the community, but it ties up dates for those national conventions and those national touring shows that is gonna bring the visitors to town. And so I think we need to look at that policy to just try to create such that some of the, some of the people, some of the events that think that this date is their date forever, there needs to be a little bit more flexibility so that those dates become available when we're chasing those national touring shows. So we haven't really addressed that part yet? No, not okay. yet. And that's across all the different facilities. It's not exclusive to just one theater. It's across all of the footprint. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many, how many um, groups are there that like want specific days for 10 years out? <clears throat> I would say probably 50 oh, wow. of the 130 events. Uh -huh. they're, they're, it's these users of the building. You've got your dance recitals, your dance competitions, your ballet, your your gun show. Who I had no idea we had so many gun shows in town. It was like, you know, it's it's those. Um, the swap meet, the women's fair, Holiday Galleria, the bridal fair, you know, they, the cars for charities, they all have like their particular date and that's the date they want for, for eternity, which I can understand from their perception as to why that's important. But when you're chasing the national touring shows, we're looking at, you know, you're not going to get a national convention chasing in 23, in 23. We're looking at 24, 25, 26. We can't have dates locked up that far out. And, and so the current policy allows for the dates to be held, but then if somebody comes in to challenge it, then they can, they can challenge, but we, we, have to, we make them go to contract. Well, of course, they're ready to go to contract. They'll, just, they'll go ahead and sign their contract for three years out from now, and so then we've lost that ability to bump them to um, host a national show, so. Has there been a more of a collaborative effort to reach out to some of these folks to, I, I guess, try to uh, encourage a day shift uh, or, or a week change if it's going to allow for a different uh, uh, show or, or another event to take that, that spot? Yes, we, we definitely have tried to do that with the tenants um, to which we've not been very successful with. Um, on the convention side, we spent many man hours um, working with two particular entities because one entity had actually booked it and contracted it and the second entity who thought those dates were theirs forever didn't even hadn't even held the dates and so you guys were about to get lots of calls from that organization because they were like this is our weekend and so trying to work through with the decorator and with how can we basically do an overnight changeover to get one show out and the next show in um, to, to accommodate their, their dates. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a bit of a kind of a crisis situation where there's a conflict. Have we tried to be more proactive with reaching out? I mean, 10 years forecast on shows seems like a long time. Makes you wonder if a show for three years from now, can you switch to the next Sunday so we can bring this other thing in? It, it sounds reasonable to be honest uh, if and I'd be interested to know if those conversations have resulted in, in a reasonable re response it sounds like that what you just mentioned seems like that might have been a little more chaotic of a situation where you got you know, someone who's planning on their dates uh, but as we go further out um, there might be opportunities to switch without I guess having to change policy or procedure right there's definitely conversations happening 
all the time, especially as their event is concluding, to start talking about, okay, what's the realistic um, that you're going to have the event on the dates that you're holding for the next year? Can we release those dates? Can we, what, what can we do? We've started to have inquiry, and certainly when we get the inquiries coming through Visit Wichita and, or, you know, through our national uh, booking team, um, having those conversations say that, look, we got somebody that's interested in this. The challenge is, is that those those current users are saying, no, we don't want to give up our date, and we'll go to contract and pay you right now for our date to keep our date. Mayor, if I can. That, I think that's why a, a new booking policy is so important, and that's why it'll be coming to you, because those are, it's a real balancing act in terms of trying to drive revenue and performance of the facility versus accommodating community groups that have had access to this facility for so long. So it, it will not be, easy i think to, to balance that but we will bring something forward for your consideration well, and that's my concern is I, i'm not interested in increasing the cost for nonprofits such as visit i mean such as um music theater wichita or to try to uh, negatively impact their um program uh, too much I, i'd rather a, a collaborative uh, approach to, to see where we can find uh, that common ground it'd be very tough i think to have a more of a political fix where we come up with a policy that results in a in a public outcry. Uh, so, because I think that some of the concern with the privatization of Century Two was, do these uh, these organizations that have been a part of Wichita for decades uh, or more, do they still get access to this, and therefore, uh, do people? able to attend uh, Century 2 events without paying higher prices. Uh, so um, if we jack up their costs, it jacks up the costs uh, to, to other folks throughout our community, and I, I think that's a concern. So I was hoping we can get ahead of this because I, I think that a policy fix um, before a good discussion uh, w would be problematic uh, for the public. I just had one more um, comment before your part was finished. Um, when the when we switched over to the current parking policy, uh, we got quite a few emails. Um, some of them, I think, are warranted uh, specifically around maybe some elderly people who aren't as good at using smartphones, or maybe they just don't have flip phones or landlines. Um, possibly looking at having options for them to pay for parking as well. Um, I know there's some places like Union Station where they have people out there in Kansas City who will also take payments at the door for particular parking spots. So um, I hope that we can look at something like that too to help accommodate some of our residents who they're not comfortable paying with um, the smartphone app pretty much. Right, agreed. We, we heard lots of feedback um, <laughs> from everything from it's about time to what, what in the world have you done? Right. Um, I will tell you it is very successful and the revenue that it's generating um, has exceeded my expectations out of the gate. I, um, the lot is full. Um, one of the things when we met with transit, they said you need to be prepared that your lot won't be full. People will park elsewhere. The lot is full every show. Um, the convention center side actually says thank you for doing that because they can get receipts now. They don't have to run back and forth and feed a meter. The vendors at the trade shows appreciate it. It's $5. It's in and out. That's 50% of our business. The other 50% of the business is the performing arts. It's over in Concert Hall and Mary Jean Teal. To me, that's probably where the majority of the complaints have come because they're not there for long periods of time. One of the things that our residents need to understand also is to come down and find other places to park. There's metered spots to the north of the library, and we're working with Lindsay in transit to get those meter heads switched out from one hour, which they previously were for the library, to longer term, again, so you're not running in to feed a meter in the middle of a theater performance. There's also a 500 spot parking garage to the north over at Garvey Center that is free of charge. It's right across Douglas, but it is the, there has to be that education. And then of course there's the parking lot to the south of, um, across from the Hyatt that is free parking as well. So creating the education of where else is there to park, 
um, is one thing. I know the question about we need to be able to take cash has, has been presented and we're, we're talking through that, trying to figure out how to do that. Not How, how do you do that? The, the reason we went this way is because of the labor shortages and what it costs to put somebody out in a booth taking money. I mean, you think about the, in fact, I kind of chuckled when I drove into the lot today and thought, I wonder how hard it is to fill this shift consistently day after day. Um, and how much do you pay them? So again, back to the, to the goal of keeping the subsidy down, how can you create revenue streams without the additional expense of labor to have to subsidize that? So I, I, <clears throat> some of the feedback uh, also is pointing towards perhaps a kiosk where folks who don't want to download an app who have had um, possibly uh, uh, bad, bad luck putting their credit card online uh, could go up, use the kiosk to grab a, a ticket for their car and walk back to the car and uh, utilize it that way where they can use a credit card or, or perhaps even cash. Um, so it, it's, you guys thought about a kiosk or something that other cities have done? Does that, I, I guess, is that part of the plan? It was my understanding that there was a plan a few years ago where there was a kiosk and it was an unsuccessful plan um, because it created patrons having to walk to the, to the thing and then walk back to their car and know what parking spot they were in. And, and so we wanted to create as seamless and as least confusing as possible. We didn't want them to have to remember what parking spot they were because we didn't want public works to have to come through and put numbers on every spot. We, we are certainly open to ideas um, the current uh, partnership that we have with Park Mobile does not offer a kiosk um, system, but certainly, you know, we can continue to, to monitor it and figure it out. And, you know, are the complaints um, mellowing out as people get used to the change? Is it still something that's still bubbling that we need to deal with? Certainly open to suggestions. Lindsay, turn it back over to you. Thank you, Chris. And some of the comments and questions stole my thunder on, on, on this next slide. Just wanted to make sure the council is aware of some general uh, things happening in arts and cultural services uh, that impact a lot of the users of Century 2. Specifically, we just want to be mindful of the local arts organizations and nonprofits that utilize Century 2 that also receive support from the city in other ways, specifically the performing arts community, um, including the tenants. As we task AS ASM to implement the best business practices, uh, generate revenue, Revenue and uh, reduce costs, we also have to balance that with the expectation of the community um, and the expectation of cost recovery that we have for the facility. Uh, so in regards to the tenants specifically, this is something that came up throughout last year and we're going to anticipate this conversation happening again this year with our cultural funding program, that the tenants historically receive operational funding support as do several performing arts organizations in the community through the, our uh, competitive funding program. The tenants are longtime recipients of this funding program, but it's not a dedicated allocation annually, but because the, the funding pool uh, has not grown, but the amount of applicants into the pool has grown, uh, it's perceived as a reduction in the allocation that we provide to these organizations. So the tenants are, are feeling a lot of pressure as they recover from pandemic, as uh, they're getting their organizations back off the ground um, to, to then have the feeling um, or the interpretation that they are receiving a reduction in city support. But really it's an annual competitive program. The, com the committee that oversees the, the cultural funding allocations does not look at past data. They, they really look at here are the applications that we have this year, here's the amount of funding that we have to allocate uh, for this fiscal year. But for the recipients of that, uh, the interpretation is a little bit different. Um, similarly, we have a lot of performing arts organizations that are not tenants of, the, of Century 2 and don't receive the perks uh, of the space that the tenants use. So uh, there's a con uh, misconception, but it's valid, and I want to make sure that the council is aware of it, uh, that we're pro providing uh, a sense of favoritism to some organizations uh, over others when our performing arts community, um, to be very frank, is crushing it right now in the community. We have some exceptional performing arts organizations and individual artists who are just doing a phenomenal job uh, making our community a better place to live. And the city does support them, uh, but when they're seeing uh, decreases in their level of support from pre-pandemic levels to, to where we are now, uh, they have concerns. So I just want to make sure that council is aware of that. Um, and then just as an industry uh, standard, as we're looking across the nation, uh, in the nonprofit arts sector in particular, performing arts are the slowest to return from the pandemic. So as we're considering operational changes, booking policy changes, 
changes, uh, we need to recognize and understand that these organizations are, are still um, recovering um, their, their own operations. And then just as an FYI to, to be a, a reminder that our arts and economic prosperity study is currently under review. Uh, this is a study that we've done for about 20 years. Uh, we should have been doing it in 2020. Obviously, that was not a good time to be interviewing audiences or, or tracking audience data. Uh, but we're doing that review right now, which will hopefully be done by the end of this fiscal year or calendar year, and should indicate some trends within the field. And we hope that that helps us inform any potential booking policy changes. And then simultaneously, our cultural arts strategic plan is under review right now as well. So as we look at how we're supporting the arts and culture sector from the city, uh, we need to look at it holistically and not just isolated to uh, how we provide uh, some organizations some support here, some organizations there. We really need to look comprehensively across it. So not just the booking policy at, at Century 2 needs um, some attention, but really how are we supporting the sector. So that's something that uh, staff, my office, and uh, a lot of uh, intentional relationship building throughout the community, interviews, focus groups, surveying, uh, how can we do the best with the the limited resources that we have available, while we also task ASM with trying to generate new revenue without displacing our local organizations uh, and artists as, at the same time. So um, I do wanna give a personal point of privilege to just thank Chris uh, for her leadership of, I'm gonna give her a, a sneaky eye here, just to thank her for her leadership at Century Two over the last year. It was definitely a transition year, both myself being new in her position and Chris being new in her position, it was a pleasure to work with her. Uh, but we recently received um, notice from, from Chris that she has uh, new professional pursuits within the community and will be leaving Century Two. So we're really devastated for that loss, but we know we're, Century Two is in good hands with ASM uh, and with Assistant uh, General Manager John Hale. We, we have no doubt that Century Two is in good hands, but definitely wanted to thank Chris for her leadership at Century 2 uh, and long-standing member of, of the community. We're happy that she's going to be retained in the community. So I uh, just wanted to make sure that personal point of privilege. But of happy to entertain uh, any additional questions that you might have for ASM or arts and culture as well. Thank you, and, and this really isn't a question, but I'm gonna take a point of privilege and just thank you, Lindsay, for all that you do. Um, you truly are such an asset to the city of Wichita and to the community, so thank you for your efforts. I'm a proud member of the Arts Council Board um, and a proud supporter of the visual and performing arts, mostly because I have no talent of my own, so I'm grateful with those who will share with me, but I consistently say that arts are not a nicety, they are a necessity in our community. And Lindsay, you know I'd mentioned the arts and economic uh, prosperity study, something that I tout the data consistently, and just to make sure I get it right, um, I think people are often surprised to know that in 2017, we learned that the arts generates $94.7 million um, annually in our total economy for the city of Wichita, and spending is uh, 43.9 million by non-for-profits and cultural organizations, and an additional 50.8 million in event-related spending, and supports 2,841 full-time equivalent jobs. So that's significant economic impact in our community and in our region. So thank you for being such a fantastic leader. And if people haven't taken the Arts and Economic Prosperity Study, there's still time. We're almost at our goal, right? Yeah, actually, um, I want to shout out to Jesse Kozar, our cultural arts administrator in the room, uh, who's been, I think, at every single event, I want to say, in the community doing surveys. We've actually surpassed our goal of 800 surveys. We currently have over 1,000 surveys in just to really make sure that we, we don't miss the mark on this opportunity. So we, we've surpassed our internal goal and surpassed the, the goal from Americans for the Arts, but we'll still pop up at a couple events over the next 30 days uh, as we wind that down. Then it goes to um, Americans for the Arts at a national level to analyze that data and give us the trends. So we do hope to get that data back by the end of this year. Um, we're sort of at their mercy, but our part um, so far is like 99.9% .9 done. But once we do have that data back, we definitely want to take a road show um, to make sure we share what those numbers look like. But thank you. And Lindsay, my apologies. I, just a quick question. I guess with that second bullet point you have, is the best way to describe that, not that we've shrunk the pie, but we got more people looking for a piece of the pie? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so, so we're distributing more, grant, or more grants 
are going out to organizations, but at a lesser amount, specifically in the large category. So that's organizations with an operation budget of $500,000 or more. Uh, last year alone, I think we had three new recipients in that category. So that just makes the amount of money we have to uh, distribute across the board less. So we're giving the same amount, but it's just not going as far as it used to. Excellent, just want to clear that up. Thank, thank you. you. Well, I also want to thank you for uh, the work that you've done and um, Chris as well. Um, looks like the, the council made a really good decision going with ASM and I can only imagine with modernized facilities how much better this could be. Thank you. Um, if there aren't any other questions about C2, uh, we'll go ahead and move right into the budget discussion, if that's all right with you. I'll ask uh, Elizabeth Goltry and uh, Mark Manning um, to come on up. Good morning, Mayor. Members of City Council, Mark Manning of the Department of Finance. I'm going to start off today. When we get to the really hard slides, I'll invite Elizabeth to come up and take care of those for me. <laughs> so we want to build on our discussion of about uh, four or five weeks ago on uh, March 21st, I think. We provided you some uh, preliminary information, some preliminary guidance. Uh, we'll update that. But we also want to talk about the policy framework under which we develop the budget each year and maybe provide some uh, things for you to think about on policy guidance and that might guide our process. Uh, we'll provide a few recommendations, particularly on the use of ARPA funding that we think we can do to tweak our process a little bit. I'll go over the CIP, which we did not talk about last time. And again, we'll finish up with some recommended policy guidance in order for us to plan for 2025. <clears throat> so our strategic management model for developing the budget has been used probably for the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, basically, our model is that the city council guides what's an important, what's what is important, and we do that through our mission and our goals. That is to keep people safe and to uh, maintain and have an efficient infrastructure and to provide quality life opportunities and to provide economic development opportunities. Uh, based on that overall policy guidance on what is important, staff develops a number of strategies. Uh, we assign dollar amounts to those strategies, and that basically forms our budget. Uh, we do this in a data-driven process. We want to use data to make the best decisions possible. Uh, we also use our performance measurement program in order to report what outcomes we achieve to enhance our uh, transparency. Uh, so if I could summarize it, I would say that we try to do what is important to the city council, and we do that by allocating dollars in areas that matter, and we report what we achieved uh, through our performance measure uh, program. So th there's other things, though, that influence our budget process. There's a variety of factors. I've got seven of them listed on this screen, but I uh, could have put many more. Uh, obviously, city policies impact how we develop the, the budget, and you'll hear a lot more on that uh, in a few slides. Our capital improvement program influences our operating budget. We link those two together uh, in a variety of areas. Our revenue structure has a significant in, in influence on our operating budget. Uh, as you know, we've mentioned this for several years, our revenue structure is somewhat archaic. We have revenues that are tied to obsolete technology in a few areas, which tends to mean that our revenues in some areas don't grow as much as we would like. And we've got some other challenges on our revenue structure. Uh, resident engagement is obviously very important to our process. We do a number of things there. We have our, our surveys, we do use the budget simulator, we've used social media events in the past, we go out to district advisory boards, and obviously we have feedback at city council meetings, so that can have a significant influence on our budget process. Uh, employee recruitment and retention, we'll talk about a little bit today, that shouldn't be a new topic, we've talked about that in a, lot, a lot in the past, and how that influences our financial results and our budgeting, as far as the challenges that we have there, going anywhere from challenging efforts to fill positions which produce savings that we don't really want to generate specifically, but also it hits us on the inflationary side too as we try to adjust our wages and, and benefits into areas that we think can help us on the recruiting side. And finally, rating agency feedback, uh, very important to us. We are active in the capital markets. We borrow a lot of money for our CIP in a measured way. 
but because we borrow money, it's important for us to recognize that what rating agencies think about us is very important. Uh, our bond rating is basically guides the interest rate that we pay for our city debt. We want to pay the lowest interest rate possible, which means more of our money can go to actual project costs. So it's very important that we uh, have a structure that is uh, conducive for favorable feedback from rating agencies. So I like to use this slide and like to use this picture to emphasize the importance of policy direction. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower reportedly said, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. I don't know that he really said planning and policy. I kind of <laughs> embellish that part a little bit. Uh, but, and I don't know what he's saying to this soldier. This is on the uh, eve of D-Day. Uh, but I'd like to think he's telling him, relax, we've got policies and procedures in place to guide what you and your fellow soldiers are going to do. And we're confident that your plans probably won't work out because you won't land where you're supposed to or the Germans might not be where we think they're gonna be, but we're confident with our policy direction, you can overcome all that and achieve success. I think that's what he's telling the guy, so we're I'm gonna go with that. the budgeting process to D-Day. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but point is, policy guidance is very important uh, to Dwight D. Eisenhower, it's very important to us in our budget process. <clears throat> and you'll hear that theme uh, repeatedly throughout my presentation. So what I want to do is I want to look at our last two downturns very briefly and talk about how policy guidance guided staff and how we responded and what we did right. So the pandemic, as you know, was very immediate. Uh, we did not have a pandemic in our plans, so obviously our plans turned about out to be worthless, but our policy direction proved to be invaluable. Now this recession was very short, and, but very severe, but we had a bounce back. We bounced back basically to where we were prior to the pandemic, at the end of the pandemic. So what did we do? We relied on our strategic management model. We looked for strategic adjustments in areas that were of lesser importance. Uh, we tried to uh, revise our strategies in order to achieve the same things more efficiently. Uh, and we also used our reserves as a short-term bridge in order to bridge us or transition us uh, into the future. Uh, but again, that was a event which was very short-term and and from which we fully bounced back from. Now let's contrast that to the great financial crisis from 2010 to 2014. I realize I'm reaching back to a period where not all of us were here, uh, but that was different in that it was structural, and this is more similar to what we're facing in the future. Uh, it's structural in that our base uh, revenues are not going to be at the same level as our base expenditures, and we don't think that we're ever going to reach that level. So what did we do? We did the same thing. We relied on our strategic management model. We identified areas of lesser strategic importance that uh, we could uh, reduce uh, expenditures in. We looked for better ways to do things. We also, again, used reserves as a one-time bridge to transition us into uh, the process of right-sizing. And we integrated the CIP closely with the operating budget. I'm sorry, Mark, how many years did that? You said that earlier. Uh, how many years? I'd say from 2010 to 2014 Four years. was when our, okay. yeah. Now that's not when the official recession was based on the federal agency what counting. Was about those four years. If you ask me, I would tell you it was a four year impact. Thank you. Basically, I, our I, assessed I, valuation I, growth is flat not for four years. Too much, but actually started in 2009. That was the first year. Fall of nine, yeah. right? I stand correct, it's from 2009 to 2014. Bob still has the traumas. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, I was, before I started in February, I was yes. called and told I had a $6 million deficit right. already. So I it, remember that. The bottom fell out in yeah. the end of 20, 2008. Welcome to Wichita. Uh, so that's how we responded the last two times. So let's compare and contrast to what our current situation is or what we think it's going to be uh, to those last two. And I will just tell you, it's a lot more closely related to the great financial crisis than to the pandemic, uh, which is to say we have a structural problem, which is to say we need long-term solutions. A short-term solution I don't think is going to solve our problem this time. And again, reserves can be a bridge. Those can help us transition into our solution, uh, but we'll need strategic adjustments. We're a little bit different too. We got some external factors that may not have impacted us as much in the past. Inflation is much more significant of a problem this time around. It wasn't as much of a problem during the previous two uh, events. Uh, monetary policy actually kind of works in our favor right now, Federal Reserve policy, but again, that's, there's some huge volatility in our monetary policy that is gonna be a challenge for us. And the workforce, during the great financial crisis, I'm not sure our workforce issues were as pronounced 
Uh, but in the future, we think that's going to be a significant challenge for us and, and will influence our projections. So uh, that's the end of the easy slide. So I think this is the point of my transition to Elizabeth to cover uh, updating our forecast. So she'll relate what she talked about in March to where we think we are now. Great. Thank you. Um, so we had a, our last workshop was on March 21st, and that was actually before um, we started the process of departments meeting with the city manager for the budget hearings that happen every year. Um, so that being the case, we told you that we'd be updating the forecasts um, regularly, and we have been doing that. Um, the forecasts have been updated based on macroeconomic trends, as well as just going through um, actuals every month in the accounting system, checking methodologies and formulas, that sort of things you would expect out of us, and also monitoring state forecasts and federal data. Um, every year on April 20th, the state of Kansas releases its consensus revenue estimate, and that's something that we um, always download and, and read. And then also the Federal Reserve Open Markets Committee um, released their summary of economic conditions the day after that workshop. Um, and in that, they forecast um, what they expect um, inflationary trends will be in the short term and the long term. So we use that in our updated projection. Whoops, sorry. Um, so this was a projection that we presented on March 21st. Um, the key points of this is that we expected to use $2.7 million of ARPA at that time um, in 2024 in order to balance and that the expected um, net loss for the general fund in 2025 was $18.1 million then. Um, in the last month, we've made a few updates to the projection. Um, the most notable is to interest earnings. Um, this is modeled based on um, an expected long-term interest rate between 2 and 3%. Um, as you might know or know, or heard, follow interest rates enough, um, the Federal Reserve tends to increase interest rates to cool down an economy or decrease interest rates in order to get an economy moving again during a time of a recession or something like that. So we have interest rates forecasted at 2, 2 to 3% in this model based on um, what we expect that we'll have to invest. Um, if the economy faced a recession that was more pronounced or longer in the Federal Reserve decreased interest rates more, this interest earnings assumption would be too high. Um, other revenue, um, we just, we go through and we update monthly based on, and, and have consistent conversations with departments. On the expenditure side, there's two big things um, in the model that are changes from the last time. Um, on the top line, you encouraged us to model in the impact of retaining firefighter positions that are currently paid for by the SAFER grant. That would add $4.4 million to the base in 2026 and $4.6 million in 2027. Um, then the other expenditure item, um, most of that is due to the draft actuarial report that the pension board will receive um, relatively soon. The good news is that funded ratios for both of the plans are gonna be in the same neighborhood as they have been in the past. So you'll still be able to um, be in a really good position compared to your peers when you go and meet with them and talk about things that elected officials talk about. Um, but um, it's anticipated that the pension contribution rates for both plans will increase. Um, that's a function of two factors primarily. One of them is um, market performance in 2022, um, and the other factor is experience in the plan, which is a variety of things encompassing wages, when people retire, and so forth. So in the next slide here is an updated general fund um, forecast. Um, the two key points here is that um, we're expecting to use a little bit less ARPA in 2024, um, even though expenditures are increasing some. But in 2025, um, the deficit is less than last time, so it does feel like a little bit of a relief. But a $15 million deficit on a $300 million budget is still significant. Um, that's still a 5% gap. Um, so we'll be talking about some ways to um, to work through that. Uh, real, <clears throat> real quick, could you remind me, um, were these estimates um, based off of us receiving no money from the food sales tax? We never modeled any policy changes to how the state sales tax allocation occurs. Okay, thank you. Yeah, 
So, yep. so that's the general, that's the sorry, update Elizabeth, outlet. Where, yes. Where do you see the increase in revenue coming from the last report to this one? Because the um, last report we had it at 298. It's mostly an interest earnings. It is most, because I had my notes that we had 8 million in interest earnings projected for 25. Yeah. Now you're saying seven. In a seven million dollar increase. Seven million dollar increase. Yeah, so increasing to 15. Okay. Thank yes, you. that's why um, I wow. think it's fair to disclose that it's based on interest earnings around two, you know, two to three percent on our portfolio. Because if a, a recession was lasted longer or the terminal rate wasn't in the two to three percent area, that would have a real, it's a lot of exposure on that assumption. Okay, thank you. That's, You're welcome. I nope. didn't catch that. When you no, pro <laughs> no problem. Yeah, it is. It is tricky because these are the changes from last time, okay. and then the last slide is the new outlook. Yes. All right. So. And why do we anticipate spending less in ARPA in 24? For just quit? because the anticipated net loss is two million now instead of 2.7. This here. We've, we've got some slides to talk about ARPA after. Yeah. Okay. But just the, the 2024 general fund budget is a little closer to balancing on its own now than it was a month ago. Does that answer your question? Yep, thank you. No problem. So some takeaways on the general fund forecast. And, and pension and health costs, those um, apply to all of our funds that have wages and benefits. Our pension costs are expected to be over $25 million annually. Um, as you remember from the pie chart that I shared at the last um, workshop, or also I shared a lot at DAB meetings and other people do too, salaries and benefits are 75% of the general fund budget. So any change to pension costs, any increase in pension costs, is, or the rate is going to have an impact on the general <coughs> fund. Um, so pension and health insurance, those two things together are 50, $55 million. Um, pension rates are volatile. They have a tendency to go up and down based on market performance. Um, there's been a pretty large, um, a pretty large um, change from 10.9% to 25.2% since 1999. Um, health insurance is budgeted to grow 6% annually in this model. There have been years where there's been no change from year to year. The rates have stayed the same. Um, but we budgeted at 6% based on what our experience has been in the past. And when it comes to health insurance, self, the self-insurance fund, the staff that in that, um, that monitors and oversees that program, um, they have implemented a new wellness program um, targeted at chronic conditions in order to um, keep costs relatively stable. So some takeaways before I hand it back off. Um, we expect that expenditures, we will have inflation or growth in expenditure, the expenditure budgets during this period, and that's mostly due to wage and benefits costs. Um, interest earnings assumptions have been revised, but as I just explained, there's um, a lot of risk there um, based on if, if interest rates were to be lower than 2 to 3% during this period. We expect some stability in 2023 and 2024. The current year is balanced and um, requires less ARPA in 2024. Um, but that balancing, as we went through in many, many slides in the last presentation, um, the two big revenue sources that are um, resulting us being balanced or close to balance in these two years are interest earnings and franchise fees. And those are Quite volatile revenues. Um, you remember the roller coaster graphs from last time. So um, we're a little exposed in those areas, but it's it's closer to the time period when we're in. So this looks like the same slide. Okay. So expenditure accelerate. We expect it to accelerate in 2024. The cyclical revenue. We we don't feel comfortable counting on that in future years like we can in the current term. Um, one of the strategies that we plan on employing um, during this time is process improvements. We've had a lot of major software programs come online, for example, and um, garnering some efficiencies um, from those. Analyzing current vacancies. 
um, really from two angles, from the angle of looking at um, are there alternate ways that we've been performing these services while these vacancies have occurred, but also looking at um, maybe new strategies for recruiting positions. And then the third thing that we'll be doing during this period is reviewing proposals that have been presented to us by departments. Um, Mark is going to talk about policy guidance um, between now and when the 2025 budget, proposed budget is put together, um, some initial steps on policy guidance and a plan for future implementation. Uh, before I do that, I want to transition to the capital improvement program. We haven't talked a lot about that in the past, and fortunately, the message here is a little bit better than maybe on the operating budget side for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> now, we do have challenges on the capital improvement side. Uh, and those challenges primarily are our interest rate environment, which interest rates are higher. That impacts our borrowing costs. They're still within our parameters, but they are increasing. Uh, and that's a, that's a bad influence on our capacity. Inflation is the other challenge we have on the CIP. Uh, now, we've adjusted a lot of our project budgets uh, with working through uh, public works, uh, but just recognize that those are two negative influences on our CIP, and those are two things that reduce our capacity to fund projects. Now, fortunately, on the CIP, our revenue stream is a lot narrower, and those two areas are areas that we don't think will be as impacted in the future. For example, sales tax. Uh, we fund basically all our road projects through the sales tax. Our sales tax, as you know, has been extraordinarily strong for the last couple of years, record-breaking strong the last couple of years. We've had 10% growth. Now, we don't expect that to continue into the future, uh, but the point is that has increased our base level of sales tax, which puts us in a really good place to grow from in the future. Again, don't get me wrong, we're not counting on 10% growth in the future. We're pretty confident that is not going to occur. Uh, but the point is our base is large enough now that we can uh, sustain a higher level of CIP projects, which is fortuitous because our current base of CIP projects is increasing due to inflationary pressures and due to interest rate uh, challenges. Uh, and I'll, I have a graphic that will demonstrate that in just a second. Now, on our debt service fund, which funds our general obligation at large projects, think public safety improvements, building improvements, uh, park improvements primarily. <coughs> That's mostly based on our assessed valuation growth, which drives our property tax collections. <coughs> I think as Elizabeth mentioned last time, we expect pretty strong assessed valuation growth in 2024, based on what we heard from the county appraiser. Just a second. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, that's a good influence for the debt service fund is that our such valuation growth is very positive, uh, we believe, so that will increase capacity. Again, we'll have the same pressures of interest rate increases and inflation on those projects there. So the takeaway is we're not in, we're, we're in pretty decent shape on the capital improvement program to fund what we expected to fund. Uh, our capacity to make any significant modifications is probably pretty limited, and we may need to make some tweaks, but we're not in near as bad a shape as we, we don't have the challenges that we have on the operating budget, put it that way. Now, I want to show you two graphics that illustrate what I said. This is the debt service fund. The takeaways here is very simple. The yellow line is our revenues. We would like our bars to be below <coughs> our line. That means we're balanced each year. You can see there's a few years where our bars are above the line. What that tells me is that we need to basically make some tweaks. We need to look at some of our project timing, maybe make some adjustments there, maybe necessary to defer a few projects here and there. Uh, but I know it's probably not reflected on this graphic, but all of that is relatively manageable in the scheme of the capital improvement program. The capital improvement program is different than the operating budget in that it's a variety of basically one-time expenditures, much different than the operating budget, which is a conglomeration of recurring expenditures. So it's easier to make tweaks to the capital improvement budget. Again, takeaway is that will probably be required for GEO projects, uh, but it probably won't be uh, to the extreme as what we've experienced in the years past. 
And Mark, that's assuming we take the full value of the assessed valuations and not keeping it revenue neutral? Yes, sir, that is completely correct. That is assuming that we exceed the revenue neutral rate and I'd also tell you it's assuming that we keep the current mill levy shift or the current mill levy allocation between the general fund and the debt service fund, both of which are policy decisions, which I'll hit in about three or four slides. Uh, so you're giving a little preview of what I'm going to talk about here in a second. Local sales tax fund, uh, again, we want the bars to be below the black line in this case. Uh, you can see this is a, this is a, I don't want to be too optimistic, but this is a pretty decent model right now. Now there's some things I could nitpick with. Uh, it probably has a little bit more debt than we probably should have, which is to say the blue bars there in the out years are probably a little higher than what we would like. Uh, but it, this is a manageable scenario for local sales tax funds. And again, that's because our local sales tax base is increased a lot, and it's also because we expect to have continued local sales tax growth, I'll bet, at a lower level in the future. We won't have the issues we had in the operating budget where we have cyclical revenues that we expect to drop significantly. So takeaway is our two local funding sources for the CIP are in relatively decent shape, and our adjustments like you'll likely to see to the CIP are going to be kind of marginal, could be some project timing adjustments, and few deferrals here and there, but in very limited capacity for new projects. Uh, uh, so ARPA, I'm going to talk about ARPA in a second, but put this in the back of your mind for a second. We think there's some excess ARPA funds that we need to use by December 31st of 2024. The CIP is ideally suited for ARPA because it's a one-time use, uh, so we think there may be some ability to use ARPA funds to supplement the debt service fund and address some of the issues I just talked to you about a second ago. I mentioned how we might need to smooth off some of the bars that are above the line. Uh, and I also would say that there's some CIP policy discussion perhaps we can have at some point that might guide us in the development of CIP a little bit more appropriately. Uh, let's switch to ARPA real quick. Uh, and I, I'll be very brief because there's only two things that we'd like to uh, recommend that we make adjustments for, both of which I think are uh, beneficial uh, to city council priorities. Again, we have 72.4 million. We have a conceptual plan for that. Uh, we've uh, adopted that each year in the budget and we've revised it as appropriate. So we've allocated the entire 72.4 million. Uh, the amount that we allocated to backstop the general fund, as Elizabeth noted, continues to shrink. The need for that continues to shrink, which is a good thing. Uh, we think, again, that there's probably at least $8 million that we will not need. She mentioned a figure of $2 million. Right now we have $10.7 million allocated for that. So, you know, if you do the math, that's $8.7 million that we think is available to reallocate. Uh, that would be ideally suited uh, for the uh, capital improvement program, for example, since those are one-time expenditures. The second change that we would recommend making on ARPA is allocating reallocating the way that we have our current capital improvement program established. In ARPA world, there's two categories to fund your projects. There's lost revenue, which is the one we like because it is the easiest one to comply with. By far the greatest flexibility. So that's the one that we gives us the most flexibility to do what we would like to do. If we don't use lost revenue, then we have to fund things in a category the federal government has established for the use of ARPA. Now we can do that and we have done that. That's things like our workforce development, small business assistance and things like that. But that can kind of reduce our flexibility in a few areas. So right now we have all the capital improvement projects in the lost revenue category. We don't have to do that. Our capital improvement projects will fit into other ARPA categories. So I think what you're going to see us recommend is basically just taking some of those and shoving them into ARPA specific categories. All that means is that will free up the lost revenue category so that we can fund things that are priorities to the city council that are kind of causing some challenges right now on compliance. Specifically, that's our affordable housing initiatives. Uh, we've tried to uh, implement that, but again, there's some challenges in how we can do that the way we want to and comply with federal guidelines. So I think the solution to that is to shove that into the lost revenue category, which we can do if we reallocate our CIP. So that's the takeaway. Basically, it's administrative. It's moving projects among uh, categories. This is a simple graphic. You can see on the left-hand side, right now we have 12.4 million that is not allocated to a category. It's allocated for ex expenditure, but not to a category. 
We believe we can reduce that down to 2.4 million if we make some changes to our capital improvement program, assign those to categories, and that's good. We would like that unallocated number to be zero. That's our objective, so. The takeaway is that'll increase flexibility for our affordable housing initiative if we can make these changes, uh, which is what I just said there. So with that background, let's transition towards the end of the PowerPoint and talk about going forward. What are our recommended steps going forward? And I would tell you that the summary is that there's opportunities for policy guidance that we think will direct us to coming up with solutions for our challenges in 2025. Uh, we think we can leverage our past process, which I outlined at the beginning. Uh, we think uh, in the short term, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's some things that we can do in 2023, vacancy analysis, maybe uh, not fill some positions that are vacant and, and start making initial adjustments like that. But we think long term, again, remember that Elizabeth showed you our challenges begin in about 2025. Uh, we think we need to leverage our engagement process, which we have used a lot in the past, use citizen survey results that we expect to implement this fall and begin the engagement process later this year, maybe in the third or fourth quarter of this year, and use that to shape our responses to our challenges that we see in the future in 2024 and into 2025. Uh, there also are some opportunities we believe to maybe review some of our, our, our policies and maybe provide some additional guidance to staff on some of our policies. I would tell you our reserve policy might be one we might want to look at. We have a reserve policy. You're very familiar with it. We want our general fund reserves to be at least 10% of expenditures. Uh, but, you know, there's opportunities to make it a little bit more robust. Uh, there's also a, an opportunity with the permanent reserve. We have the permanent reserve, or what the mayor calls the rainy day fund. Uh, that is also sitting out there. We have never really formally established a policy, not only for how we use it, but for when we put money into that reserve. Uh, that's something I would highly recommend and that we'll develop some, uh, some options there on, uh, but that would guide the use of, that, of those reserve funds so that we can strategically use those in the future. And incidentally, this would also be viewed very, very favorably by our partners in the rating agencies who monitor our reserves very, very closely and very in tune to how we intend to use them. Mark, can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. So I'm always concerned about our rating. You know that. Bob knows that. We talk about that a lot. So if we implement, what I hear you saying is, is if we implement policies regarding a more structured way to do that that would help our credit rating potentially to, to stay or improve. Absolutely. Okay. That's what and, I'm telling you. And so then my next question, and I don't want to put the cart before the horse because I know we have a lot of budget stuff to do, but are we working on those policies then? Because that's something that I'm very interested in. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank yes, you. Yep. And again, we'll, we'll provide recommendations on what those policies should look like based on best practices and a variety of other things, and, and we'll return those uh, at the appropriate time. Thank you. Revenue policy is another area that uh, we might want to consider. Uh, we, again, all these are areas in which we re have received guidance, but maybe not quite as formalized or, or uh, as it would be appropriate to do. There's a lot of things that we might think about on revenue policy. I talked about the mill levy uh, a little bit uh, ago when, in response to Councilmember Fry's question. Uh, what's the policy guidelines on how we should split our mill levy between the general fund and the debt service fund? Uh, what are maybe some of the areas or the mechanisms in which we should assess user fees? Now, again, we have a model for that. We have the cost pyramid that we use right now. Uh, but it might be appropriate to develop an overall comprehensive policy that outlines all of those uh, recommendations and is consistent with the uh, desires of the city council. Uh, annual review is another thing. Again, our process is a little bit piecemeal, maybe on some of our review of fees. It might be better to have a model in which we review them periodically and maybe some criteria under which we adjust <laughs> them frequently to keep up with inflation, for example. Employee compensation is an area that is extraordinarily complex and challenging. And recognize that we have about two thirds of our employees represented by bargaining units, which also uh, makes it a little bit more complicated. But the challenges that we have here is, is our current compensation mix appropriate for the workforce of the 21st century? And I know that's a pretty heady uh, 
uh, assertion to make, but I think there might be some opportunities there to, to determine what policy direction the city wants to do as far as what benefits we off offer, what our compensation looks like, how we choose to compensate employees. Elizabeth mentioned benefit costs. Uh, we have legacy benefit programs, which I would argue, as a legacy employee, that they're strategically important. Now, obviously, that's self-serving for me to say, recognize that, but uh, they do serve a purpose strategically. They help us attract and retain employees, employees that value those programs. I think what we're finding is a lot of, on the recruitment side, maybe employees don't value those programs. So is our appropriate structure the correct one? Uh, again, I don't know what the answer is. I know what some of the challenges are, but it might not be a bad uh, policy discussion to have to try to figure out where the, what's appropriate as far as where we want to put our city dollars on health insurance and pension in the future, long term, and in employee compensation for that matter. You know, do we retain our current model of pay matrices with annual merits and cost of living? Do we adjust that? A variety of different things we can do, uh, perhaps to be more strategically attuned to the current environment and maybe perhaps more fiscally uh, responsible, perhaps, or fiscally viable, I should say, not responsible, viable. Capital improvement program, we have policies there. Again, it might not hurt to lift the hood up and look at those, how we finance projects, what term we use, 15 or 20, you know, again, the mill levy, what mill levy rate are we going to use, how are we going to use our so local sales tax funds. Again, we have, we have policies and procedures that guide all that, but it wouldn't hurt to maybe refresh those and take a look at those and, and, and put those in a comprehensive policy. So next steps, Council Member Tuttle, to your question, staff will present a reserve policy, uh, a revenue policy, and CIP policy recommendations in the future. We'll also look at employee compensation. That'll be a little tougher nut to crack, but we'll take a look at that. Uh, we'll also, in the budget process this year, propose some preliminary and incremental steps to kind of maybe shape us better for the future. Again, our vacancy analysis, and maybe some tweaks here and there on things that departments have uh, identified as areas that we can tweak a little bit. Again, everything that we're doing is designed to position us better uh, so when the challenges that Elizabeth noted occur, if they occur, and I'm pretty confident they're going to, uh, if and when they occur in the future, 2025, that the city is better positioned to face those uh, challenges. Again, we'll be better positioned with better policies and with adjustments that we begin making in 20. Uh, 25. Again, staff will work to develop engagement strategies uh, for this fall and winter that will help us during our budget process next year. Uh, one complaint that we often hear on engagement is that we do it too late in the process and we don't provide enough time to do it in a thoughtful manner. And, you know, that may be a justified criticism because we typically do it in May or June of each year and we have to present the budget in July. Uh, our model going forward, uh, what we would like to do is develop a model where we basically start the engagement process about six or seven months ahead of when we propose the budget next July. Uh, we think that'll uh, generate a lot more robust discussion, provide a lot more opportunity uh, for feedback to influence our process. So again, we'll coordinate with the communications team on that as we do. Uh, we'll use past survey data which has been very valuable. We'll also use survey data from this fall that we anticipate uh, collecting. That data is very, very important on what our citizens think, what our residents think. And, uh, and so we'll develop a, a, a strategy for that engagement process uh, that we will then leverage for the 2024 and 2025 budget process. Mark, can I ask a yes, question? Yes, ma'am. So when we're talking about engagement, I know since I've been here, one of the things that people were the most I don't know if excited is the word when we're talking about budgets, but the budget simulator right. where people actually got to go in and then they put their price of their home, or if they didn't own a home, then it was the average price of a home. And then they got to play around with the budget and say, I want more police, I want less parks, I want more this, less that. And then it showed how, you know, what the impact would be on the overall budget. And it, it, will it be something like that again, yeah. do you know? For Mark, if I could jump in. Yeah. Please. Okay, so let me, I want to, I hate to, repeat, but I want to summarize and make sure that the process is explained for the 24 budget as well as the 25. The concern I have about the, some of the engagement tools that we've used in the past is that 
the guidance that I think you're going to seek and the kind of meaningful feedback we get from those tools is much better equipped for 25 and the hard decisions you're going to have to make. Yeah. So we're proposing a change in the way that we use our engagement um, for 24 and 25. So what we plan on doing, so first of all, just so you understand the deliverables and what to expect in the next workshop and as we prepare the final budget recommendations. You're going to get the reserve policy and be asked to adopt that, and that'll have impact for 24 and more, even more important for, importantly for 25. You'll get a rev revenue policy from us. You'll get uh, uh, policy recommendations on the CIP and establishing priorities. And then we're going to do a strategic staffing. Um, we'll, uh, we're going to make recommendations on strategic staffing adjustments, and those are going to be centered around longer term vacancies that we've had in the organization. We're going to look at current outcomes and then we're going to make some decisions based on, excuse me, we're going to make some recommendations based on the citizen survey data that you just reviewed recently. And so that's where, if you remember the quadrant system, mm -hmm. we're going to rely on that data that was generated uh, from residents on what we should look at seriously for adjustments and where maybe there are some things that you want and the citizens want protected. And so we'll use that information to help position you for 24. Then we intend to do significant work. You adopt the budget late August, right? We'll give everybody maybe a 30-day rest and then we're gonna jump into the budget, the staff discussions for the 25 budget with the understanding that you're going to need a series of, of policy recommendations that we're going to shop to you much earlier than we normally would and so we'll work with staff through the fall and, and very early winter to, to put together a series of um, uh, policy recommendations and uh, uh, decision uh, or options excuse me policy options and then we believe that we should engage then with the public using our other tools that have been a lot more robust because now we have meaningful trade-offs, right? We'll, have, we'll engage you in a workshop probably before the end of 23 to say Here are the, here's some of the heavy lifting that we think may be necessary. But the, the simulator is a great example, the uh, social media town hall even better. We found through years of doing social media at Town Hall that we get the best responses when we say service X versus service Y or this level of service versus that level of service. That people really get engaged in that and I think we use that feedback over the last two years to shape the last two budgets. We're really not there for the 24 budget but we will be there for the 25. And we, if you endorse what we want to take to the public for discussion in early, or in late 24, early, or excuse me, late 23 or early 24, then that gives you a running start on the budget. And you will also have the opportunity to do more engagement as we go for, forward if you want to do much more drill down. But we, just because of the potential size of the budget adjustments and the fact that we have to make structural changes to get us through 25, 26, 27, um, we think that's where you really uh, engage with the public. I do think we lose public trust if we try to go through an engagement process that isn't really going to help shape the document that much. And unfortunately, I think it's where we are in 24. I think the feedback we got in that survey will be extremely valuable for the kinds of adjustments you'll have to make to balance 24. I just really want to applaud you for that. I, I, I've been trying to talk with community members um, in my district, but throughout the city, and explain that in 25, you know, a $15 million deficit, you know, budget shortfall, and then a 21 million, and then a 24 million is significant. And things are going to have to change, right? We're going to have to look at how we provide services. We still want to, you know, make sure that we're providing good quality services, efficient services, but we're going to have to make some real priority changes. And so I, I really like the way you're thinking, and, and, and I applaud you for that. And also thank staff in advance, because, you know, staff is always so busy, and then now we're adding this additional work on them. But we have such good quality content experts in their departments and having them engaged as well as our community members, I think, is how we're going to get through this. So thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. We're Sorry for the by, pause and discussion. We're hoping by giving you that much time that you can make strategic decisions, right? Not just tactical, 
yeah. you know, or have your back up against the wall and suddenly here we are in a May workshop and you have to make these hard decisions. And, um, but this is just our thought right now. I, at this workshop, I'm looking for some affirmation of that or some tweaks. Is there anything you want to do differently? Just let us know because this is your process and, and you got to feel comfortable about how we're going forward. And Mr. Manager, would that also be including the feedback we get from the various departments for 5% uh, budget cuts, what their recommendations would be? Yeah, uh, Vice Mayor, that's exactly what we're talking about doing in the fall. Mm -hmm. is that, so we've had some preliminary uh, thoughts submitted by but, uh, departments. A few of those may actually find their way into recommendations on the 24 mm -hmm. budget. Uh, some fee adjustments, some service adjustments, <coughs> but what I would consider the heavy lifting we're going to work through in the fall to then share with you towards the end of the year. And so that'll be tied in as well with uh, the results from the survey about what the public expects. Um, actually, it's, they're kind of, it's kind of split or bifurcated. The survey will help us with the 24 recommendations, and then the 25 recommendations are what you're talking about. It's reflective of the 5% um, with survey as a baseline, but more importantly, the feedback that you get from engagement at the end of the year and early next year, that will help then uh, refine that and help you with priorities. Yeah. Thank you. One more comment, and I don't want to derail the conversation, and I'm sorry, but while it's on my mind, and my voice is obviously the only one I have, but I think I heard from my colleagues as well, I really liked the process before when we had to think about cuts of what's untouchable, what's you know, maybe next tier priority and then f below that. So that's just one thought while I'm thinking of it. I liked having that untouchable list that we can make sure that we preserved and then work down from there. So just my thought. And I, I don't want to rely too much on the survey, but I like that methodology because it helps the council, I think, not just that tool, but that thought process, right? Because if you think about the quadrant, the things that you're going to want to protect or, or invest in are the things that people have said are high priorities yep. and they want to see service improvements, right? We're going to have some that are low priorities and people are accepting of the current service levels. Yep. I'm hoping that framework will help you as you talk through it. Good job. Sorry, Mark. I just have a couple more very quick slides just to remind you what our process is recognize our calendars basically based on state statutory requirements uh, so here's uh, here's what we have to look forward to in the future <clears throat> again another workshop maybe on about may 23rd uh, we will get our assessed evaluation from sedgwick county on or before june 15th uh, that's very important because that'll tell us what our our uh, property valuation will be and what our property tax revenues will be in obviously how accurately we forecasted uh, we may have to make some adjustments plus or minus usually we're pretty close Mark, yes sir you used an estimate already for this budget what estimate did you use that's an increase from last year's uh, what about 6.7 which is very aggressive uh, we came into this year last august our projection for this year was a lot more Conservative, I think we were at about three percent, <coughs> based on feedback uh, in the county appraiser's presentation of the county board of county commissioners. What a month or two ago, uh, we would expect that to be a lot more higher, a lot higher than what we initially thought. So we're at six point seven right now, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Six point seven. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, real quick, we we know that there is some legislation out there that. Are trying to put an amendment on there to cap the um, assessed valuation at 4%. Right. Um, I'm sure you guys have a plan B in case that that happens, or is that something that we need to figure into? Well, if that happens, then that would be a policy change, and we will provide information to you about how that will impact our forecast, similar okay. to what Elizabeth told you on the sales tax. Again, if that policy is adopted by our legislators in Topeka, then we will provide you guidance on what we think that will do to our financial situation. I hate holding my breath like this, waiting to see what they come up with. But. So uh, the assessment evaluation we get on June 15th will allow us to finish our budget recommendations. Uh, the revenue neutral rate uh, based on state statute, we, we need a decision on that by June, July 11th on whether we uh, want to consider exceeding that or not. Uh, just for technical reasons, we would typically recommend that we do that because it's a very complicated statute and difficult to comply with. 
but there is a policy implication, obviously, to doing that. Uh, we would uh, like to schedule a second evening meeting, if that's the will of the City Council. We've done that in the past. Uh, we would look for that uh, on uh, July 25th, and then we would hold a third public hearing on August 15th, uh, a final uh, public hearing to adopt the budget and approve exceeding the revenue or approve considering the revenue neutral rate and or exceeding it, uh, if that's the will of the body, on August 22nd. So that's our kind of tentative schedule right now. Uh, again, that's the end of my presentation. So be happy to respond to any more questions if there are. Any questions for Mr. Manning? Uh, Mr. Manager, do we have it in our budget for a three-star general helmet <laughs> for Mr. Manning for future presentations? <laughs> Rally, you gotta earn that four-star mark. <laughs> Vice Mayor, if I could just, this isn't a question, but just yes, a, a comment. Um, I know that our finance team, this is a incredibly time consuming time of your life and a process and that's not lost on me. So I just wanna thank you, um, thank your team, Mark. Thanks Elizabeth for all that you do. I, I've said consistently since I've been in this office that where you put your time and your treasure is a reflection of your values. So thank you for helping us to, to be navigated through this process so that we can best serve our community. So I don't, I don't have a question. I know you were asking about direction and confirmation of this. I, I like this outline. I think the policy discussions are gonna be really valuable because we always have questions about reserves and, and how to use those. And I know we did a modification of the CIP created a grid a few years ago on that, but I think all of that discussion is good, but that sounds like a really long workshop. It's just like five <laughs> policy proposals in here, which I'm fine with, but this sounds like a really long workshop to talk about this. And the employee piece, um, is there any way we could kind of ask some of our employees what they think? Because I know a lot of the, when I was talking with transit, some of the younger employees don't always think about long-term pension and how good that really is for you and what is it that they are looking for versus the really good benefits we have and we, we can't do this in a vacuum it's not just going to be uh, you know the department directors speculating on all of that we have to go to our employees so uh jason hood our hr director will be help us guide that, that process so we get employee feedback um and uh, you're right i think there is a split in the organization and as we have people coming on we talk to them about uh, health care, and we talk to them about pension, and in many cases, that's not a driving force for them. And we know that they still have to have coverage, but maybe we look at, for new employees, a different kind of compensation package. That's, but we don't know until we talk to folks, right? And I think uh, when we, we were kind of brainstorming through this uh, last week, and then there was some talk about, you know, do you also talk to folks who applied and didn't accept a job? So I, we're going to have to be thoughtful on how we get that feedback, but we have to work with our employee groups as well because they're representing a, you know, a, a good significant number of our employees. Okay. Well, I like this. That will be done in the fall. That will not come to you. That's part of the heavy lift during the fall. So is the mill levy discussion now or does that fall too? That was one of the recommended conversations. When you say the mill levy, you mean the balance between you know, for CIP and operating budget, or just policy discussion? I, yeah. guess. I didn't know which specific yeah. revenue and reserves will come to you and be adopted as part of this budget, okay. and we'll get those to you in advance, um, and we'll have probably some discussion at least of the basic principles at the May workshop on those two. And then also there may be some guidance or some points to talk about on the CIP policy as well. Okay. All right, any more questions or discussion? All right, thank you guys. Um, thank you. I guess that ends it for today.